So, next thing is um, traditional front engine rear wheel drive vehicles. We didn't have drive shafts on those. Instead, what we had is a prop shaft driving a final drive and differential. Yeah? We had our live axle. And we've got no drive shafts, we haven't got drive shafts fitted into a live axle. What we've got is we've got half shafts. Half shafts because they are half, almost half the width of the uh, uh, axle. Yeah? Um, the typical ones that we are, we'll talk a little bit more about these after, but the typical ones that you actually uh, see on light vehicles are what they call of a slimy floating design. And that means the bearing is actually mounted here and the drive flange is attached as one piece. It's actually made in one piece with that shaft. Spline on the inside there, you can just about make it out on there as well. Spline on the inside and that engages with the differential, directly with the differential gears. There's an oil seal on the outside of this, so this whole casing is sealed and it has oil inside. Sprung live axle with a prop shaft in that type of design. Yeah, that's actually known as a Hotchkiss drive. Okay, Hotchkiss drive. Now, look at it from the side, there's a line diagram, that's what we've got there. Yeah, we have our chassis along here, our leaf spring on here, the swinging track on the back here, axle. In this case, now this is unlikely that you'd see this on a light vehicle, axle suspended underneath the leaf springs. If you look at the Corolla and if you look at the Piaggio, uh, actually I think the Piaggio, I could be wrong on that, but the axle is actually on top of the leaf springs. Wheel here, we've got our pinion that we, you were just talking about, that's the end of the pinion. Uh, universal joint there, prop shaft along here, another universal joint here, and our gearbox. Notice just here, sliding joint. Oh, is that where it connects to the gearbox where it has the movement? For yeah, um, there's a couple of different ways of doing that which we'll have a look at. But as the axle moves up, the distance between the gearbox and the uh, pinion sure. is going to shorten. Yeah, It's going to change length. So because of that, we've got to account for that changing length. And that's the point. Okay, so um, so the Hotchkiss drive as a whole is, is what we've been talking about there, but specifically what I want to do today is have a look at the propeller shaft, yeah, prop shaft. Um, and what we're talking about, as, as we said, this is the, the big difference between a prop shaft and a drive shaft is what? One prop to one drive. What's the big difference? Prop shaft. What's the propels. difference? Say again? Prop shaft propels. Yeah. No, the prop is shaft. the drive shaft not? The prop shaft takes it to the final drive. The um, drive shafts from the final drive to the wheels. Good man. Yeah, absolutely. So what we talk about when we talk about a prop shaft, what we're talking about is the connection between the gearbox and the final drive. We're not talking about something that goes from the final drive to the wheel. Typically, we will call something that goes from the final drive to the wheel a drive shaft because that is doing your final bit of drive. With the exception being when we talk about half shafts, they don't really get called drive shafts, although technically they are still drive shafts. Okay. So it's the common set question, the, the only difference, the, I mean the main difference that's if the prop shaft is not the final drive. Yeah, prop shaft connects gearbox to final drive, that's it. whereas um, drive shaft connects final drive to wheel. That's our main difference. You might have a split prop. Okay, this was actually off a a commercial vehicle, a, uh, just a, a light vehicle, uh, something called a, a Sherpa van. Okay, and this was a lot longer, but to, to make it sort of manageable, and so it fits in the cupboard uh, that's been cut down. Okay, and that's a, a split lock because we've got that centre joint in it. So what they are it says the split props uh, to avoid the fact that if we had one long shaft, the shaft would actually begin to bend under its own weight. Um, and as that happens, when you're actually driving, that bend would be acted upon by centrifugal force and get worse. And actually create a vibration, it would actually pull, pull the shaft, uh, prop shaft out of balance. So by putting the centre bearing in and splitting the prop, <coughs> we support it in the middle, and the shorter shaft, uh, shaft length just makes it that much stiffer, so we don't get this problem of sag. Proper term for that when that's happening is prop shaft whip. 
almost, it, 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 the way I, I tend to have a, a mental representation of this as being a skipping rope. Yeah, you can pull it tight, yeah, but when it starts spinning, it's actually bending. Yeah, and the, the prop trough does the same thing. It obviously doesn't do it quite as much. It only bends a tiny bit, but it actually bends. And that leads to vibration. Short props, you're going to have to be going at ridiculous speeds for that to happen. Longer props, because as I say, the natural tendency for it to sag under its own weight, that happens at much lower speeds. So that's why if, it, if we're going to have to fit a longer prop on something, it's common to find a centre bearing fitted and a split prop. Now that split prop has actually got another advantage. Okay, So it doesn't just make it stiffer, but a split prop actually allows for a lower transmission tunnel. Now if we have a look at this design here, the single, single piece prop, if the axle was to travel all the way up to here, yeah, or let's say it's actually it was on top as in a light vehicle, which is where it really matters, uh, if it's on top here and it travels full travel, it means our transmission tunnel is going to have to come up from the end of the gearbox up to the height of the axle. But if we can run a split prop, then it can actually stay at that level until the split, and at that point, go up there. And that allows, so by using this split prop to, uh, method, we can actually lower the transmission tunnel inside the car, giving them a small space inside the car. It's a good thing. Okay. Now, prop shafts, as we said, they've got to have some way of changing length. There's a couple of different ways that you'll commonly see of that. The first one being a sliding joint that slips into the back of the gearbox, which again is what you've got on the Toyota and on the Piaggio. Okay. And the reason for this is just simply simple mechanics. As it actually moves through top, now this is an extreme, but to give you an example as an extreme, that's when it's straight ahead, that's its longest length. On full droop, that's its shortest length, you can see it's changed length. Well, if it's bolted on at that end, at some point it's got to change. Okay, and in this particular case, it's at that far end. And what you can see here is the setup that we've got. Well, we've got a splines that engage into splines that come out of the back of the gearbox, and this area here, this, uh, this surface here, should be polished, and an oil seal in the back of the gearbox allows that to slip in and out and stay lubricated. Is it so right? these splines are permanently lubricated, splash fed uh, by the oil inside the gearbox. Thanks, you about to say something. Yeah, I was, but I was talking about something else. You, you send the, the oil cells around the outside of the shell? Yeah, it, it's in the back of the gearbox and it actually slips on the outside like, here. Like on the piston on the uh, brake, on your, well, on your, on your caliper, it's like that, so when it comes out it doesn't like allow the... This is more like a crankshaft oil seal. Have you replaced one of those? No. Okay, so the, uh, the oil seal on the crankshaft, um, where the front pulley goes in, there's an oil seal there, uh, and it's, it's just a lip type oil seal, rubber oil seal like that. There is another type, and quite honestly, this actually brings a whole new set of problems. And this type um, is where it bolts onto the flange that's bolted onto the gearbox, and the actual sliding joint is here, okay, behind the UJ. The, the problem with that is a double. One is that you've got to, you can actually strip these apart. When you put them back together, you've got to make sure they're aligned. Uh, it's something to do with phasing, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay? Now, uh, the other problem with them is we're no longer reliant on the gearbox oil to lubricate this. And so we've got to put a uh, grease nipple in and some way of actually lubricating that to actually keep it to, uh, good. Another problem, again, is I've seen people on certain cars where it's easier to take the, uh, um, where, where you take the engine gearbox out together. I've seen them put, actually strip it at that joint. Rather than trying to unbolt this, this, uh, this is actually fairly easy to come apart. Okay? And so they've literally just pulled it off of there and left that bit, the front half, attached to the gearbox as they take it apart. Problem is, when they put it back together, 
they don't know where it came out from. And unless you know about prop shaft phasing, you're completely ignorant because there's no master spline on this and you can just put it back in in the wrong position and end up with a vibration. Okay, and we'll have a look at the reasons for that in just a minute. You know, you walk, the ones we need to make note of are that shackle. It's going to allow for movement. The sliding joint. It's going to allow for movement. Actually, so do the one, two universal joints. They allow for movement. Because if we didn't have a universal joint or a, a constant velocity joint, then the, the prop shaft would be solid with the gearbox and it couldn't move. So Miguel was just asking about the um, how can you actually get it out of phase? Because if you look at the prop shaft we've got there, it's one piece. You can't get it out of phase. The yokes are permanently welded to the prop. You would ha actively have to cut the prop in half to get it out of phase. That's, and that's a fair comment. However, remember I said some of them have actually got the actual prop shaft slide in a different position. And this is an example of that. Okay, and this is what the type where you can get it out of phase. So if we actually prop this off, <coughs> and we drop the prop shaft down, it is possible to take this off. And this is what happens. People take these off, <coughs> and keep the, that attached to one housing, take the other, other part out, they take it off, and they're not aware of it, and they actually put it out of phase. So now, that prop shaft is no longer in phase. <coughs> okay? Because these are not in line, there's no mirror image here. Now, as this one is, because these are actually the same way around, now what's happening is as this one turns the shaft fast, this one is trying to turn this shaft even faster. When we're talking about live axles, as I say, no drive shafts, all they've got is half shafts running from centre depth to the way. Three different bearing arrangements on the outboard end. Okay, the first one is what we call semi-floating. Now, unlike vehicles, this is the most common type. The type of stuff that we're going to come across as a light vehicle that's fitted with this, it will have this type of axle arrangement, or this type of half shaft arrangement, and wheel bearing arrangement, because it is cheap. Um, and I think we spoke, so, someone actually brought this up last week about yeah, how you fit the freeze in it. And yeah, okay. So, I actually found this picture, and it shows the bearing here, bearing arrangements, and it shows the collar that holds the bearing in place. Okay? So this collar here, you press the bearing on first, and it's not pushed, uh, when I say pressed on, they're not on their tight. It's this bit that's on their tight. This is the bit that holds the bearing in place. And uh, by heating that up, putting it in place, and letting it cool down, it actually shrinks onto the actual half shaft and holds the bearing in place. Don't be tempted to press it, because you'll actually remove metal from this, and that won't fit as well. Equally, don't be tempted to weld it to hold it in place. I have seen that done. It promotes stress fractures in the half shaft 
it causes the shaft to snap, and it will snap just by the weld. Okay. Problem we have with this design is look where the wheel mounts. It's quite far away. It's quite a lot it is, isn't it? Well, the wheel, problem wheel bearing is. Yeah, it's going to look really So, this cross here is our wheel bearing. This is our axle casing. Here's the actual drive flange where the wheel sits on these studs here. And what forces do you think that this is going to be, the poor old half shaft is going to be subject to? Bounding. Shear, bending, or torsion? All of them. You've got an answer, you've got an answer sheet in your handout, I think. There we go. Shear, bending, or torsion? Circle the one you think. So that'll be all of them. Could be if you want. Use a pencil if you're unsure. So let's have a think about it. Right. First, uh, first one, shear. Because that we could do, because it's going to be to yeah, launch your beast. 100%. It's just going to, if the wheel stays tight, like stays script, and the other's trying to spin it. That's not shear, though. Shear would be actual, the weight of the vehicle being yeah. supported by the wheel here. And the way the vehicle acting on the axle case here, on its bearing here, is trying to shear the shaft at this point. Yeah, so that's shearing force. Okay, so you've definitely got shear there. You bend the same way, don't you? Bending loads. Have we got bending loads in it? You can bend it. Yeah. What about when we go around a corner? It's going to be bend, yeah. As we corner corner, really, is this trying to bend in relation to this? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We do get bending loads of these. Torsion. Torsion. Twisting. Twisting. Well, it's a drive shaft. It's going to twist. All of them. Yeah, so it is. Indeed, all of them. <sighs> okay, this is a bit rarer, but not that rare. Um, if you still find it on um, some vehicles that use a live axle, but it tends to be older ones. You find it on some live axles on commercials, but and also on uh, um, 4x4s. I don't know what your Volvo's got, to be perfectly honest. I would guess, if I, if, just because Volvo tend to actually overbuild things, mm. my suspicion is it'll be this type. It's a lot of actually, it's a big yeah, and I'm, I'm guessing it'll be this the type of bearing arrangement, although it's easy to check. Okay? Because there's a couple of characteristics of this. So what we've got here, we, again, we've got our axle case here, but this time the bearing is mounted on the outside of the axle case, outer diameter of the axle case, typically. Okay? And our shaft, the drive flange, is supported by the bearing, and typically directly by the bearing. And the shaft could be pulled out whilst leaving the bearing and drive flange in place. Heard okay. And does anybody heard of Quaif? Company Quaif. Quaif. No, Quaif. Quaif actually do a conversion for the old Mark One and Two Escorts to turn it into this three-course floating setup. Because that's standard that came with a uh, semi-floating axle setup. This is a bit heavier duty for bigger tyres, so it, it, that's what we tend to use. Here, but here's a question for you. Again, if you're unsure, use a pencil. Which forces is the shaft going to be subjected to? No, so just the shaft. Mm -hmm. Circle the ones you think. Use a pencil if you're unsure. If the bearing failed, it's going to have shearing and bending. 
So that's only if you want. I'm not talking about the bearing failing, I'm talking about when the bearing's in place. This is an upgrade, and this time we've lost the shear. Yeah, but there's no shear on this. It's supported vertically by that bearing. It's still bend in the middle, though. If it's but it does bend. A tor that's what you're talking about there, Max, is torsion. Okay, so that's torsion. The twist, the twist in the middle, that's torsion. Then how is it bend otherwise? It's a drive shaft. It must have torsion. But interesting, the bend bending loads are also still present when you're cornering because these tend to be single row. Roller bearing. Lastly, roll bearing. Ball bearing roller. So they can actually move a little bit that way. So, so the cornering roads, when you go around a corner, you still get a little bit of bending. Not as much, but you still do get some bending force in the in the half shaft. So for this one, bending and torsion. Not really. I'm Fully floating. <coughs> So, third one. Now this is the type that Luke will be most comfortable with. This is the type that's actually fitted to heavy commercial vehicles. In this one, very similar to the last one, except we have two rows of bearings, and invariably they are taper roller bearings. Yeah? Facing each other, taper roller bearings, and the hub drive flange is so supported by those two taper roller bearings. Typically, you'll also see on the back of a truck, on the end of the actual half shaft, a, a ring of bolts. That if you undo the ring of bolts, you can actually withdraw the half shaft. And leave, that's without removing the wheel. Okay? So with this type, and this is fully floating, What forces is the shaft subjected to? Again, circle it. Which one do you think? Use a pencil. Yeah, if you're sure, use a pencil first. Right. Have we got shear? No. No, because it's fully supported by those two bearings. What about the bending loads this time? No. No, because we've actually got two opposed tape of rolling and roll bearings eliminating any of that. So the only thing this half shaft has to put up with is torsion, because it is actually twisting to drive the vehicle. So that's the only thing it puts up with. 